Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So today I want to talk about spells, specifically cone spells. I've talked about cones before. I tell you things like, you know, that cones are harder to place than ranged sphere or cube effects, and that the range of cones is pretty limited, and that avoiding friendly fire can be harder with a cone, and thus I don't consider cones to be a great shape for an area of effect spell. Still, there are good spells that are cone spells. Fear, for example, and cones do have some advantages, and a big cone covers a very big area, so it can hit a lot of creatures. Hi, if you like the content on this channel and you're interested in supporting it, you can do so through Patreon. You'll find a link in the video description. Patrons of this channel can see these videos early and without YouTube ads, and my top-level patrons can join me and play some D&D every month. Today I'd like to thank these top-level patrons. Ryan Gardner, CJ, Cass Byrne, Christian Windham, Unknown Watcher, Craig Locklear, Dan, Dank Train, Dash Panther, Dave Peters, and David Edgar. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. I took a look through the spells to see how many cone spells were in the game, and I found 10 spells. It's possible I missed some, but here's what I found. Burning Hands is a 15-foot first-level spell. Color Spray, 15-foot cone, first-level spell. Frost Fingers, 15-foot cone, first-level spell. Then we get to second-level spells, and there's Dragon's Breath, 15 feet. And Conjure Barrage is a ranger spell, 60-foot cone. That's a third-level spell. Fear is a 30-foot cone, third-level spell, and Pulse Wave is a 30-foot cone, third-level spell. Then we jump to fifth-level spells. There's Cone of Cold, which is 60 feet, and Investiture of Ice is 6-level and gives you an action to make a 15-foot cone, and then Prismatic Spray is a 60-foot cone at 7th level. The question is, when you use a cone in combat, exactly what does it hit? I mean, how many options do we have in regards to where to place it? So, I want to go over the possibilities today. First, let's look at what the player's handbook has to say. A cone extends in a direction you choose from its point of origin. A cone's width at a given point along its length is equal to that point's distance from the point of origin. A cone's area of effect specifies its maximum length. A cone's point of origin is not included in the cone's area of effect unless you decide otherwise. So, the basics here are that the point of origin, at least in the case of the spells I discussed, is either the caster, or in the case of spells like Dragon's Breath, the creature you imbued with the spell. So, unlike other spells that will generally have an intersection of squares as the point of origin, the square the creature where the effect emanates is going to be the point of origin. Then it says, the width of a given point is equal to the point's distance from that point of origin. So the cone's range and its width at the end of it are the same. And then if all the lines are straight, then you've ensured that no matter how far you are from the cone's point of origin, the width is the same as the length. And finally, it says the cone's point of origin is not included in the area of effect unless you choose otherwise. This is fortunate because you don't want to catch yourself in your own burning hand spell. But, according to the rules, you can include yourself in the effect if you want to. So, you could do this if you wanted to, and then you would be included in your own area of effect. So, I guess there could be some kind of cone effect which was beneficial. Then you might want to include yourself. Currently, at least with the spell options available, that's probably not an option you want to take advantage of very often, but maybe there will be cone effects in the future that provide beneficial effects. And that is the limit of what the Player's Handbook tells us about cones. Though we should also remember the assumption in the Player's Handbook is you aren't playing on a grid. So how cones should be used on a grid gets a lot more attention in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. In that source book, we are given two methods for dealing with spell shapes on a grid. The template method and the token method. So let's go through both of those. The template method says to use a two-dimensional shape to represent different areas on a grid. You create a template, which could just involve cutting out some paper, or on a virtual tabletop like this one, drawing it, like I have done here. Then we would follow the same guidelines as the player's handbook. 
So the flat end of the cone is as long as the spell's range. And then we can place the template anywhere on the edge of the square from where the spell emanates. So we could just put it there, or we could put it there, or we could do that, or we could do that if we wanted to. Any square that's within the spell's effect, even slightly, is affected by the spell. At least that's what the rules say, but I advise you check with your DM first, as I think the waters have gotten muddied on this with some designer responses to questions. So in the case of a straight cone, just like this one, there is some question which squares are included. So you end up with some muddled rules, because sometimes DMs will say the edge of the square is the point of origin. Others might say the edge of the token is the origin, or the base of the mini, if you're using miniatures. Also, if we look at the green bottle cap, maybe the edge of the square needs to be overlapped, or maybe it is the token itself that needs to be overlapped, or the base of that token. Or maybe it's at least half the square will need to be covered by the effect. So in the case of the green bottle cap now, it's questionable whether that square is included in the effect or not. But I think if you just go by the rules as they are written, you are placing the cone at the edge of the square if you are playing on a grid. Then every square that is intersected by the cone at all would be included. So in the case of this placement, it would be all the green bottle caps, those squares would be affected by this cone. So in this case, we have 29 squares affected by this 30-foot cone. But with the template method, get ready for some non-Euclidean geometry nonsense. Because when you play a grid in D&D, unless you are using the optional movement rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide, movement diagonally on a grid costs the same movement as movement horizontally or vertically. This means when it comes to movement, that distance from the corner to a corner of a square is the same in regards to movement rates as the side to the opposite side. That means if a creature moves diagonally 30 feet away from you, they're more than 30 feet away when it comes to the cone template, since it's not taking this into account. So why would you use a template? Well, one thing about templates is they tend to be fairly quick. At least once you and your DM are in agreement about which squares will be affected by the template once it's placed. Once you have the template, you place it wherever you want and you're done. The other method suggested in Xanathar's Guide to Everything is the token method. This is the method we're going to spend the most time on because it has the most variations. It is not the easiest method to use, but frankly, it's probably the most fair method as well as the most precise. The token method shows us exactly what squares are affected by our cone spells. In addition, gives us precise instructions on how it can be placed. Yet it still gives us lots of options. But with cones, there's no question it's the most complicated and varied, which is why I'm making this video. So Xanathar says the following on the token method for cones, so let's go through each portion of it. A cone is represented by rows of tokens on the grid extending from the cone's point of origin. In the rows, the squares are adjoining side by side or corner to corner, as shown in diagram 2.5. To determine the number of rows a cone contains, divide its length by 5. For example, a 30-foot cone contains 6 rows. So, we see the two examples given in the diagram, and we see the direct cone is longer, but narrower, and the diagonal cone is wider, but shorter. But in each case, exactly 21 squares are included. But those aren't your only options using these rules, though any option we choose will include the exact same number of squares affected, regardless of our choice. So it goes on to say, here's how to create the rows. Starting with a square adjacent to the cone's point of origin, place one token. The square can be orthogonally, which means at a right angle, I had to look that up, or diagonally adjacent to the point of origin. Now, remember, according to the player's handbook, we also have the option to include the square that is the point of origin if we want to. Otherwise, using the token method, exactly one square on any side or corner of the point of origin gets included in the area of effect. In every row beyond that one, place as many tokens as you placed in the previous row, plus one more token. Place this row's token so that their squares each share a side with a square in the previous row. So what this does is first, it approximates a triangle shape, roughly. But secondly, it ensures that every row is exactly five feet wider 
than the previous row. Also, if we're casting the cone diagonally, the exact shape of the cone is determined, and it's going to be wide and short. With a diagonal casting of a cone, this is the only option you have. But that doesn't mean this is the only place you can place it. Depending where we place it on our original square, we could have it be like this, with the red dot representing the area where the cone is emanating from our square, or this, or this. All of these fulfill the requirements. But if you are casting the spell orthogonally, then our options have just begun. If the cone is orthogonally adjacent to the point of origin, you'll have one more token to place in the row. Place it on one end or the other end of the row you just created. You don't have to pick the side chosen in diagram 2.5. Keep placing tokens in this way until you've created all the cone's rows. So here is where cone placement gets very interesting. So in this case, we're going to say the blue bottle cap represents our character. The yellow bottle caps will represent the cone. So we're casting a cone spell and we decide to place the first token in a position that's orthogonal to our point of origin. Now on to our next row. We get to place two tokens. The first token must be placed adjacent to the previous row. So right here. Now we have a second token to place, which we could put right here or right here. Then on our third row, we have three tokens to place. Two of them must be placed here and here, but the final one could be placed here or here. So we just have a 15 foot cone, but we have eight choices regarding the direction we fire it. And if we choose one of the four orthogonal directions, we have four different shapes that cone could be. The longer our cone gets, our options increase exponentially. In fact, we're talking twice as many options for every five feet of the cone's range. So with a 30 foot cone, we're talking over 30 options or over 2000 options with a 60 foot cone. No, we're not gonna go over all of them, but I'll give you some examples. So this here is a pretty standard looking 60 foot cone. But what if we wanna make it a little zigzaggy? Well, then we could do this. You can see this one kind of banks right, then left, then right, then left. Completely legal under the token method. Here's one that starts out right and then does a hard bank left. This is kind of the, I wish I was two squares to the right cone. Also completely legal by the token method. This one here, also legal by the token method. This one's probably pretty useful if you have some allies over here, but you still want to hit some enemies over here. This one here is pretty much going to the right, but then just goes to the left right at the last moment. It doesn't seem like a cone should be able to do that, but again, by the token method, this is a legal shape. With 30 foot cones, again, lots of options. Here's 12 of them. All of these are legal under the token method. So how does this impact gameplay? Is a player going to have to pour through over 2000 options before placing the cone? In the case of these 60 foot cones, there are 78 tokens. Do we want a player placing 78 tokens according to the token method every time they cast a cone spell? Absolutely not. So if you're playing on a grid and you want a method that is quicker, I think the template method is the way to go. But you just need to understand that the template method isn't always fair. It doesn't necessarily include the same number of squares depending on the direction you fire it. And you might have a player playing with the positioning of the template for quite a while as well, seeing how many squares they can include. So can we use the token method at all? Because we do have some advantages here. I think it's very fair. It's very consistent because we're always covering the exact same number of squares, no matter what direction we fire it. So let's say this is our character here and we're going to cast a cone and let's say the blue bottle caps represent allies and the red bottle caps represent the enemies. Well, how many enemies can we hit? Well, technically speaking, we could probably hit all but one of them. There is no way we can hit both this enemy and this enemy because it is too distant and they're three apart. So if we we're going to include two squares, we can include those two or we could include those two. Same thing with allies. We know that we can easily miss this guy and we can easily miss this guy, but we can't miss both of these two because they're only three apart and we're going to have a three foot wide cone at this point. So 
if we want to avoid all allies, and usually when we cast our Eve effects, we do, then it's just not applicable at this point. But, you know, sometimes an ally might say, oh, go ahead and put me in the cone uh, because we can hit a lot of enemies. How many enemies could we hit? Well, in this case, we could absolutely hit five enemies. I can tell you that right now. And we would have a little bit of a choice. Uh, if this ally doesn't mind being hit, we can hit this enemy. And if this ally doesn't mind being hit, then we can hit this enemy. So, for example, if we don't mind hitting the ally on the right, we could just place the cone here and then here and here and then straight up there and then after that it doesn't matter and on the other side it would go up to here and then it would have to go straight up and then it would go up here and we could avoid this ally and then here and then we can hit all those enemies now if we don't mind hitting the ally on the other side well then we could just put it through like this way and then we hit this enemy here and then we go ahead and hit this ally here and then we can hit all these enemies and on the other side, it would have to go straight up to here. And then we would continue it straight to avoid our allies there. And then after that, it would just continue on. It doesn't matter. So either way we do it, we can hit five enemies. But the cost is we're going to hit one ally. And those are the only ways we can do it without moving. Now, if we were to move, like up to here, well, then we could only hit two enemies. Because we could move the cone up like this. And that's as good as we're going to get. And although we avoid our allies, we hit a whole lot less enemies. But we don't have to draw this. We can see this. We should be able to tell who is included and who isn't with a few seconds, honestly. Then you roll the damage and you're done. Probably actually is going to take about 10 or 20 seconds to figure it out. That is, once the player and DM both know how the token method works for cones, then this shouldn't take any longer than the template method. It might even take less because in fact we have fewer options because the template actually has countless options so when asked recently how I deal with spells when I'm the DM well I like the token method personally but I don't want a player taking a lot of time drawing their cones a player who casts a 15 foot cone is gonna hit six squares a player who casts a 30 foot cone is gonna hit 21 squares and a player who casts a 60 foot cone hits 78 squares I just think that's the most fair to the player. And yes, they have a lot more than eight options in regards to placement. So let's hear it. How do cones work at your table? What do you think of the token method? Let me know what you think. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.